I'm Nate Angel, and I'm calling in now from uh, Portland, Oregon, where it's raining, which is pretty typical for Portland, Oregon. Um, I'm also a um, uninvited but very grateful guest on um, indigenous lands that we call Nichiwana, um, because there are so many um, indigenous peoples that have inhabited this Multnomah Valley region. Uh, and I'm joined here by my uh, co-lead in the Open Learning Journey uh, track, Ramy Kalir. Ramy, would you like to introduce yourself to the folks and say hi? Greetings, everyone. Um, and I uh, should say again, my name is Ramy Kalir. Um, I'm in Denver, Colorado, uh, which is uh, also the ancestral homelands of the Arapaho, the Cheyenne, and the Ute people. Um, and really appreciate all that Nate has done to really shepherd our entire open learning journey forward, both his work publicly and also behind the scenes. And to all of you for showing up and being a part of our journey today. Thanks so much for being here. Yes, thank you so much. And we have uh, so many different folks who've been involved in MyFest in different ways. This, this is a this is one of those um, <clears throat> events that sort of um, started out by like, hey, wouldn't it be a good idea if we did some um, professional development and chance to get together during uh, June, July, and August this year? And a whole bunch of people said, yes, that would be really great. And then someone was like, my dad has a barn. And then the next thing you know, here we all are um, <laughs> putting on a show uh, together. Um, so we really appreciate everybody's contributions to this um, at every level. Uh, and so uh, I just like to uh, introduce what we're doing here today. So this, um, this particular session, um, is and actually let me uh, let me go ahead and share my screen. That'll that'll put some context in it. This particular session was um, <clears throat> organized to kick off the second week of um, my fest uh, open learning journey track. Sorry, it's so many different things to say at once. Um, and so the open learning journey track has been going, it started last week and it's gonna go next week as well. So it's a three week long journey. And we try to design it so that each week sort of has a theme and has a kickoff. And we're at week two's kickoff right now. Um, and then, uh, but each session can kind of stand on its own and doesn't need, uh, doesn't, you're not required to have attended all the sessions in order to get value of any one of them. So um, one, uh, the, the theme for this week is um, really around the tools and platforms that folks are using uh, in open learning and open teaching and learning and education context. Um, and this kickoff was really designed to try to um, have a step back a little bit from all the other sessions that are gonna happen this week that are much more focused on very specific tools and instead just think globally about the tools that we might use for open learning um, in, in a global context and things that we might be thinking about when we think about using tools in open learning. So this is sort of the meta conversation that we're gonna use to kick this off. And we've, we've gathered some really um, interesting uh, and uh, insightful guests here today that um, I think will be able to help set the stage for what we're doing the rest of the week. Um, we did already happen to have one of those hands-on learning tool sessions earlier today before the kickoff, um, but that has been recorded. That was on EdTech Books platform, and we have upcoming uh, sessions that will be on Pressbooks, Hypothesis, Libretex, um, OER Commons, uh, and one other one that I'm drawing a blank on right now. Um, and it's, who knows, there may even be a surprise one coming in in a little bit. Were you going to say something, Ramy? <laughs> no, it's, it's external. Ramy's got a lot of stuff going on in his house. So at any rate, um, without further ado, um, I wanted to just um, quickly uh, give you a, a little bit of an idea of all the guests that we've gathered here today. Um, and they're going to uh, introduce themselves and talk a little bit about their, their background and perspectives in open learning. So we've got Tel Amiel, who's calling in from uh, Brazil, actually. Uh, Lauren Lichtman, who's calling in from New York. Uh, Navia, who's calling in from uh, Austin, Texas, if I'm not mistaken. And finally, Purva Ashok, who uh, as normally calls in from Canada, if I'm not mistaken, but maybe in a different place that she's in Canada today, Toronto, right? Um, yes, Toronto. So um, what I'm going to do to start things off is, um, and we'll be distributing these slides after too, and, and actually adding to them as resources come up during the conversation. But what I'm going to do now um, uh, is actually kick things off by handing the baton to Tell and asking Tell to kind of give us a little bit of an understanding of um, you know, how he comes to this conversation around 
open learning tools mm -hmm. um, with a global perspective. Introduce yourself, tell, and kind of let us know what your thoughts are and what we should be taking away from thinking about open learning tools and practices from a global perspective. Wonderful. So great to be here. Thank you, Nate, for the introduction, and great to be here with all of you. Um, so I've I'm, I'm here in Brazil, in Brasilia, in our capital, and I, I teach at the University of Brasilia and also at the uh, University of Nova Gorica in, in Slovenia, where they have the uh, Leadership and Open Education Program. And uh, I don't want to take too much time in the beginning because I think the conversation is going to be more interesting, but I wanted to give you an idea of, of where we are when we think about uh, open education tools and some of the perspectives that we gathered from working with educators and, and you know, public management and institutions and the like. So I start with this, um, I'm trying to kind of bring up a, a train of thought here, a, a logical train of thought of where we are today. And, and I start with this project, which is called uh, the uh, Surveillance and Education Observatory that we have here in, in, um, in our uh, initiative, which is uh, trying to map surveillance capitalism in education. And uh, the site's available in English, Spanish and Portuguese, but I just wanted you to show you what, uh, some of this data and, and give you an idea of why we, we think about open tools and how we think about them. Uh, we're, we're really worried with this scenario that you can see on the map here in, in, in South America. Um, and we have similar data now coming in from, from countries in Europe and, and North America as well, where we, we look at, at how um, institutions, uh, particularly in this case, higher education institutions, but also basic education, uh, are partnering with uh, large scale commercial uh, proprietary platforms in education. Uh, and we see this as, as not only a threat uh, to the idea of open education in general, uh, but, but also of, of sovereignty and of, of how uh, platformization of education is really threatening the way we, we think about education, is progressive education. So uh, this map uh, kind of gives you a really clear perspective on what's happening on these 483 institutions, uh, all public institutions in South America. And if you look at every little dot in red, you're going to find that this institution has a partnership with either uh, Google or Microsoft, for example, and adopted their learning platforms, which is a closed proprietary learning system. Uh, the, the, the green dots are fairly scarce, and they're, they're uh, scar scarcer as we, move, as we move on over time. Uh, we have all this data available for, for people to navigate, but um, I wanted to highlight just one piece of information, which I think says, says a lot, which is that 80% of all public institutions of higher education in South America already have adopted some sort of closed learning platform. And this has been a, a very important theme, uh, a very important theme for discussion uh, in education. And I think it should particularly be uh, a topic that we discuss in open education because uh, as the pandemic has shown, uh, uh, the future, it will be um, in whatever country you are in the world, the discussion on the future of education is, is hovering around uh, what kind of platforms and systems we're going to use to implement some sort of some version of whatever people conceive to be hybrid education. And this is being co-opted by the market. And in a way that this market is directed towards large scale uh, surveillance capitalism platforms. And this is this is troublesome to us because of the scale, but also uh, in terms of the numbers of institutions that are, are, are adopting these platforms but also how it's creeping into basic education and co-opting you know, co data from students and young students, creating uh, you know, some sort of uh, a fidelity to use these platforms and, and things that we've seen happening over and over again. Uh, particularly of, of interest, I think, for us as, as open educators, and I think just looking from the, the tools that you guys mentioned in the beginning, we're very much interested, interested in adopting open source and free and open source tools uh, like Pressbooks and the ones, uh, other ones you've mentioned in the beginning. And, and the adoption of these kinds of platforms makes it very difficult for us to work in an open space. I mean, the, the, the extractive uh, phenomenon that's behind is the business model that's behind these platforms is diametrically opposed to what we believe in as open educators using open tools and the like. So this is where I'm coming from. Um, and it might not be where, where other people are coming from, but this is how I approach it, at least in the past five or six years as we've seen this grow. So one of the things that we've done to try to mitigate this, and I think it's, it's one attempt of, of trying to address this, is to promote the idea of, of open source and, and free software to, to work with open educational resources and to work with open education in general. So I'm going to show you some things that are in Portuguese because that's where, where, we, are, you know, where we are and who we're, we're speaking to, but I think that other people have, might have similar initiatives that, that we could talk about. So we started this, it's called the Free Choice or Escolha Livre Project uh, during the pandemic, in the early months of the pandemic, where we try to share 
uh, open source tools, testimony, interviews, um, you know, just videos, tutorials that people could, could learn about uh, the power of open tools to share, to create virtual, virtual conferences, to, to do uh, collaborative writing, all these kinds of things that we were trying to do during the pandemic, during em uh, emergency teaching and still apply today. So, you know, we'd have tutorials doing it, uh, models of, of how they could implement it, and then, of course, tools that they could use like Etherpad or OnlyOffice and Wikiversity as alternatives to the things that might, you know, that might be being pushed for them to use. So this was one way we started to address this, to try to uh, promote and create awareness of, of alternative tools that can be used by educators in their current practice, easy to use platforms and systems that are just as good or better than proprietary platforms and don't, don't enact uh, you know, extractive data and threats to privacy. Uh, we worked with a lot of, of uh, pre-service teachers to create tutorials for all these other free software tools. So uh, instead of using something like, you know, even a Google search, you could use DuckDuckGo. Instead of using Twitter, you could use Mastodon. Instead of using something like Dropbox or Google Drive, you could use a Nextcloud instance. Instagram, you could use PixelFed. I mean, all sorts of alternatives that are really a great places, safest pla um, places, I'd say, for educators to, to engage with students in a, in a social network, for example, rather than using big media like, you know, Twitter or or something or Instagram or something like that. And so we have all these really nice, cute tutorials that and very effective tutorials that our students did for other students. So they could learn how to uh, create an account, how to use it, what purpose it would have for them, uh, and to explore these different tools instead of having like a, you know, a, a, a prejudice uh, uh, on, on using open source tools because they just never used it or they heard that it's not as good as proprietary tools. This is one of the bigger things that we've done uh, and we try to push forward. I myself use tools like this. I use uh, Wikiversity extensively to put all sorts of content that, that students uh, use all the time and create. So even, you know, uh, reports on legislation and, and tutorials and analysis of, of uh, distance and open education tools, analysis of, of tools like Facebook, you know, uh, Google Drive and Instagram from a perspective of surveillance capitalism, all sorts of stuff, stuff that students do on this perspective of reusable assignments. I, I, I like to use Wikiversity for that and, and keep it as a, an open platform. And so students can always share what they create and it's usable by other students in the future. And we kind of keep doing this over and over again. So I, I try to show them that these things are things that I use and I think they should use as well. And to just a, a final example, which I think is, is neat, as we've been doing at, at uh, the University of Nova Gorica is, is we've been having some really extensive use of Mastodon as a, as a, a tool not only to encourage students to think about open source tools and to understand what open source tools are, but also we're very much interested in showing them how this can be used in, a, in, a, in an open practice. So we normally adopt some sort of a hashtag, like in this case, OESLOE, and we have a record, a permanent public record of our discussions. And then we bring these analysis of what's happening in, in Mastodon to, to the students. So we can see how we're talking to each other, who's posting, who's responding, sort of networks of interaction. And so we use the fact that this is an open tool also to do some sort of like open analytics of what's what's happening in our discussions and present this back to the students every week to have a discussion about how we're interacting and how we're we're talking to each other. Um, and I think that's a pretty exciting thing that's been, been pretty useful to, to, to show students how open tools afford not only the, the principles of open and free software, but an open API or having open access to data also allows us to use this data ourselves to, to analyze our own learning. And just to wrap up, I'll share this link with you. Over the, these past semesters, the pandemic semesters in the Open Education for a Better World program, we've had this pad where people kind of contribute all sorts of open tools that they're using uh, in, their, in their courses that students are using and recommending to each other. And uh, I'll share this with you as well in the hopes that you'll add whatever cool things you're using uh, in terms of open source software that we can also learn from. So thank you. Tell that was great. And, um, you know, one thing I was noticing in your um, use of Mastodon, it looked like you were using the Mastodon.online um, server. And because it is decentralized, there are different Mastodon servers that one could use. Is there a particular reason why you have chosen to use .social or no particular reason. It's just a very robust server. So we we, we started we started testing up some and some weren't as robust as others. We started wanted to start our own instance eventually. So uh, hopefully we'll get to that. Right. There are um, there are various different um, Mastodon instances one could use, and there is that opportunity to host it yourself if you have the resources to do so. Um, you know, I want to open it up to um, other folks. Uh, 
who are here, including our guests, um, uh, Lauren or uh, Navio or Apurva, did you have um, kind of comments or questions that you wanted to pose to tell? I don't think any at this time, but it's um, really exciting to see this kind of higher level view about how you're viewing um, open systems, particularly um, not from a US perspective, which is sometimes what I think we see here, even working in the international space, but being based in the US. So that was quite useful. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Hal. Well, and maybe that's um, all the more reason to just um, actually shift over to um, the next our next set of guests here. So, um, Lauren and Navia, um, sort of the same question to you. You know, you also are working in a project that has a kind of international scope, um, and uh, I'd be curious to hear uh, sort of your similar kind of point. Like, how to, how is it that you uh, get it, got engaged in an open learning tool set and um, and what are you doing in that area or what's your perspective on it from a global point of view? Fantastic. Yeah, thank you so much um, for having us today. Just again, quick introductions. My name is Lauren Lichtman and I lead partnerships and strategy at Learning Equality um, and I'm joining you from Muncie Lenape native land. Um, and over to Navia. Hello everyone, I'm Navia. I lead our training, development, and strategy here at Learning Equality, and I'm on the native land of Tonkawa. Wonderful. So I think this question that you posed, Nate, is, is really important. And for us, um, where um, our focus at Learning Equality is always kind of sit at the intersection between the kind of open contents and tools that are available, particularly on the internet, some of which Tal mentioned and disconnected communities. And how can we take a more equitable approach to providing learning opportunities in a quality way, even when you don't have access to all the resources that might be available on the internet. And so that's the lens through which that we look at open tools and, and how to develop them and how to leverage what exists is just to make sure that there are resources available for those in more lower resource contexts. And so for us, um, we focus on a variety of barriers that we see um, globally, uh, one of which is related to infrastructure limitations. So I mentioned already places where there might be limited access to internet. Um, and we know that about 40% of the world doesn't have access to the internet, an even higher number having um, access to consistent connectivity to be able to access some of the online tools that were mentioned. Um, but also limited access to, to hardware and other kind of networking equipment and other things that could really uh, make use of digital learning tools. Second kind of bucket area is recognizing that there are really fantastic uh, openly licensed materials or even materials perhaps in local language, but they might not always be accessible due to licensing constraints or how they are being shared digitally. And even if they do exist, they're not always easy to identify um, depending upon the metadata or limited time for a teacher to identify those resources. And so we're very cognizant of that type of barrier. And the third kind of bucket is um, more limited understanding of how to blend technology into different learning environments, not just teaching about technology, but also teaching with technology and the digital literacy skills that are needed to support that. And so um, learning equality as a nonprofit based in the United States focuses on these kind of five areas um, to be able to address these barriers. Um, and we'll talk about one of our specific projects in a few minutes. Um, so the first is that we create offline first needs driven ed tech. Um, and, and this is really the crux of our work. And we focus on Calibri, which Navia will talk about and some of you might be familiar with. But for us, it's really important that we're focusing first on the needs in lower resource offline communities. The second is how we facilitate organic and scalable use of ad tech, really trying to eliminate as many barriers to accessing these quality learning opportunities as possible, um, recognizing that you know, infrastructure isn't the only barrier um, or cost, but there might be some others to accessing these tools. The third is around fostering student-centered and equitable learning. Um, so a lot of our work is really on um, providing educator support so that teachers can um, better provide these blended learning experiences in lower resource contexts. Um, the fourth is around how we can create systems change. Um, and a conversation like this is, is one way in which we can continue to educate each other. Um, but for us, a lot of this has to also do with advocacy around the creation and use of open curricula 
data sets, tools, and blended learning practices. And the fifth is on building learning communities so that we can share with each other how different um, open tools and, and, and open content can be used in lower resource learning environments. Um, and so for us, we have kind of three main perspectives on, on open that we'd like to talk in, about today and bring to this conversation. Uh, the first is around recognizing that there is often hidden costs to adopting free but not open tools. Um, and we see really great in benefits to investing in open source. So we know that um, free and open source development can help to focus developers and designers on core and commonly needed functionality that's not biased towards a very specific need and is then not adaptable. Uh, customization and adaptation allows for products to be extended and reused in new ways, which is really important so that we're not reinventing the wheel. Um, and I'm sure a lot of this is known amongst its community, but something that we see a lot through our, our projects. Um, and the third is on the use of the software continuing indefinitely, recognizing that there aren't necessarily recurring costs for licensing and subscriptions, but instead development costs or implementation costs can really be focused on building capacity and sustainable infrastructure. So we see really great um, benefits to investing in not just free, but also open source product development. The second area is on focusing on the reusability R of OERs. And we see this as being a more efficient way to using openly licensed content, but also ways to support educators. Um, and for us, this means making sure there's smart investment in content creation so that if there are already content that can be um, adapted and reused in different ways, that we kind of fill in the blanks of what might not exist that's more locally relevant to help contextualize what currently exists and to not continue to create new content that already exists perhaps elsewhere, um, but could instead have useful derivatives. Um, and also um, one of the benefits of the reusability R is that we can reorganize and align content in different ways. And this allows for greater buy-in over use of the content, allows for um, more effective use of educator time, uh, increased motivation levels, and also just support the ease of use of discoverability of OERs. Um, and the third area is that we really value open communities to share lessons and insights. And because what we've developed is um, an open ecosystem of products and tools. Uh, there's really that supports a do-it-yourself model. There's really great value in building these communities to share lessons. So these are the kinds of things we'd like to discuss uh, today through the conversation. I'll turn it over to Navia to talk more specifically about Calibri, which is the way in which we primarily do this. Thanks, Lauren. Um, and feel free to drop in questions in the chat. So as Lauren mentioned, our current efforts um, remain focused around Colibri, um, which is Learning Equality's adaptable set of open source software and openly licensed materials that are designed for offline first teaching and learning. And it is adaptable and open so that a more localized experience can be provided. Um, and with this approach, we've reached millions of learners across more than 210 countries and territories um, through a variety of implementers, some with our involvement and some without. Um, and we estimate having reached many tens of thousands of learners already. So Colibri provides access to a curated and openly licensed educational content library available in a variety of different languages um, in both academic and non-academic subject areas and grade levels focused on K-12. Relevant sets of materials can then be imported onto our offline platform with simple workflows for managing and keeping it updated, um, especially because there is no access to internet. And then learning materials can then be updated from the internet or from a USB thumb drive or from any other device over a local network without access to internet. And then these materials can then be accessed by learners offline without the internet. So learners can watch videos, read documents, play games, interact with simulations, practice using exercises um, with real-time feedback from, from the teacher, the facilitator inside a learning space. And then within the platform, the learners can then be grouped into classes and can be assigned lessons and quizzes by an educator for a personalized and differentiated learning approach. 
And we have also developed the openly licensed Colibri EdTech Toolkit, which contains pedagogical materials to support blended learning and training of trainers. And this toolkit consists of resources that support usage of the ecosystem of the products across a variety of learning environments in our open model. And we also have a Calibri, what we call as a Calibri data portal tool, which gives access to centralized data for implementing organizations to then make decisions accordingly um, at an aggregate level. So I wanted to provide an example of one of our long-term um, collaborations with Agami, which is based, um, and they do work in Bangladesh. And Agami works across government schools in Bangladesh, and they are a Khan Academy Bangla language advocate, which means that they have been um, the ones translating Khan Academy into Bangla and providing that content and the support and the teacher training in government schools and public schools in Bangladesh. And in addition to that, they also develop additional open content digital learning resources, and they also provide educational training materials, and they use the Colibri Learning Platform in order to provide access to all of that offline. And they use Colibri in many different ways. It's not just a traditional um, teacher teaching kind of model. They use Colibri in group learning models where learners um, share a device. Um, they also use Colibri in a standard like whole instruction model where the teacher um, basically uses Colibri on a projector. And they're also now piloting um, in the next few months to use Colibri in a take-home model where learners are at school learning from the teacher. And then they also have access to Colibri at home to um, revisit, refresh, and also um, think through how to go about homework. Um, so there's that kind of hybrid model that they're piloting in the next few months. And they are an active participant in our open Colibri community. So they're part of our Colibri Harvard Grants Program. Um, they have participated and shared their um, learnings and challenges in our community forums and in our virtual learning spaces, which they have been a huge part of throughout the past few years and we hope to continue. So this is just one example of one of the ways in which we engage with our collaborators. And there are other organizations like Agami that um, kind of think through all these different pieces together in terms of how to work with our ecosystem of our products. But this is one of the ways in which they connect all those different pieces and then advocate for open and um, work at scale in government schools in Bangladesh. So really excited to the dialogue and happy to answer any questions. Yeah, if, uh, there's one great question that's general from Virginia that I want to hold until we, we've all had a chance to go. Um, but if anyone has any specific questions about Colibri right now, happy to. Uh, how is it funded? Huh? Virginia asks. Sure. Um, so it, interestingly, um, as I'm sure you all know, uh, trying to have funding for open source product development creates its own set of challenges. And, and actually we um, did pitching for a um, areas of investment for funders um, at the Rewired Summit in Dubai in December. And we specifically focused on the importance of investing in free and open source um, and talk through some of the points that I mentioned on the discussion side. Um, for us, we're funded kind of through two primary means. One is through, um, grants. Um, a lot we are fortunate to receive funding from um, a variety of funders that provide either general operating support or project specific support um, to develop Calibri. And the other is through, and so some of those include Hewlett Foundation, which is actually how we got connected to Nate for today's discussion. Um, but we've also been funded by google.org to really develop out the Calibri ecosystem. Um, on the other side, we also are funded through um, what we would term as contracts, but often is also through grants from third party funding. Um, and this is to be able to do more project specific work where we can work more closely, likely typically with an implementing organization such as Agami to really understand their specific use case with Calibri so that we can better um, improve our ecosystem. And at times we're contracted for specific services that help to enhance the use by a particular organization, such as providing specialized training or supporting them with integrating their own content into Calibri for use or supporting with curriculum alignment efforts. Um, so it really depends. 
Um, and then, you know, within that, we also receive some support from individual philanthropists, um, either through family foundations or, you know, individuals on their own to provide support. But um, yes, I mean, there are, I'm sure we could talk at length about the challenges of funding open source, even though we know, like in the long term, there's kind of, we can really make smarter investments in education programming if we also fund um, free and open source product development because the kind of recurring costs look quite different. Hope that answers your question. Yeah, that's great, Lauren. Um, thank you. Uh, there's so much to talk about there probably we could all we all might have different perspectives on it um i have some background there too um and, and there is i think what you're really getting at lauren is this idea that because needs might be generalized across many different contexts if we put our resources together to fund open source development we might all end up being able to move forward tool sets uh that uh we would wouldn't then have to buy and pay proprietary commercial organizations for exactly um, and for us too, a lot of the discussion is like how we can support funders and also governments and understanding what the costs around open source product development look like so that TORs in particular can be better designed to, to meet those needs because oftentimes it just doesn't align with the type of product development we're doing, even though the kinds of recurring costs around licensing that you're describing just don't actually exist for what we do. So true, so true. Um, well, let's um, let's hold that. You know, maybe uh, sustainability is another question we can return to in a second. Um, but let's give Approva a chance to weigh in here too. And, and one thing that I'll say about Approva, when I when I invited her to uh, talk about tools, she immediately came back with a, "Well, I'm actually all more about the practices in the community." And I was like, "That's a really good part and an important po point to make. And part of tools and how effective they are is what is what is the practices and using them, and what is the community that uses them and sustains them." So, uh, without taking away any of her thunder, uh, Approva, why don't you? Uh, why don't you speak to what you were going to say from your perspective on this? Thank you, Nate. Also, thank you, Tel, Navia, and Lauren for uh, teaching me a lot and giving me a lot of tabs to, to go and explore after our conversation today. Um, uh, as Nate said, uh, my name is Apurva Ashok. I'm the Director of Open Education at Rebus Community, and I'll tell you more about Rebus and specifically the community piece as I dive into my uh, conversation today. Uh, before I do that, I also just want to contextualize where I'm coming from. Um, I'm from Bangalore, India. Um, I've had the privilege of living in various parts of what's called Canada now for the past decade. Um, today, I want to acknowledge that I'm joining everyone here today from the traditional territories of the Mississaugas of the First Credit, the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, the Hooded Oshoni, and the Wendat peoples. Um, I'm very grateful for the privilege to live here, to work here, um, and uh, just to be able to meet and learn with all of you from this territory. Uh, I'll also note that, you know, this Territorial, territorial acknowledgement is just one part and one step in my commitment to reconciliation and decolonization efforts. Um, it's a small part of other actions and practices I do in my local community and outside of my professional life. But I hope that for all of us, it serves as a powerful reminder of the histories that have shaped our present and um, hopefully can inform the work that I think we're all trying to do to build better and more equitable futures. Um, so Rebus community, uh, and I'm not going to share slides, I might show you a few tools in a moment, but I'll keep chatting and if you have questions, feel free to pop them into the chat. Rebus community is, uh, you can call it the open education and professional development arm of um, a global nonprofit called the Rebus Foundation. So the Rebus Foundation is really simply put, trying to make knowledge freely available in pursuit of equity, understanding and the common good. And at the Rebus community, what we're doing is trying to empower educators, give them the know-how and the network um, to publish and adopt open educational resources, primarily through communities of practice. So what we're trying to do um, is to really build uh, the next generation of OER leaders to strengthen diverse and different viewpoints in academia and also to center the student experience um, and student perspective um, all towards um, um, improving equitable outcomes. So we offer a number of guides and resources and community spaces, um, as well as offering um, free webinars, workshops, or professional development um, to help people do this work. 
So I might actually begin by showing you some of the um, free tools that we use um, that you can connect with that might answer one of Virginia's questions in the chat as well. Um, and then I might tell you a little bit about just our approach behind these tools and maybe approaches that need to be reconsidered in light of what was shared by the other speakers today. So um, on this screen here, and Nate has already very kindly dropped in a link to the chat, a uh, link into the chat. Um, this is um, called the Rebus Community Forum. This is really our, our primary space for connecting and communicating with um, people all around the world. This is a um, forum that is powered by um, a tool called Discourse. Um, and this is really a space where folks can come together to um, be transparent about um, OER publishing projects that they're working on to ask and answer questions. We have sort of a help and questions um, forum space where folks can talk specifically about OER creation, challenges that they might be uh, coming across, or just general questions around the philosophy of um, um, open pedagogy or advocating for OER initiatives at their institutions. Um, there's also a contributor marketplace where folks can really make calls for, for help that they're seeking um, to come together and to say, I'm working on project X, we're in need of someone with uh, instructional design expertise or technical expertise or peer reviewers. Um, you know, someone is looking for um, uh, help with a, um, uh, interest in niche genres of music. So this is really a free space that anyone can um, sign up on the top right hand corner to create an account and log in. Um, this is also one of the spaces we use as part of our professional development programs for asynchronous conversation. Again, we're mindful of the fact that folks are coming to this work from different parts of the world and in different time zones. It's hard to get everybody together on a video call um, at the same time. So we really appreciate having an asynchronous space where folks can come post calls for participation, ask or answer questions, or just say hello and connect with um, other members of the community. If you're browsing on the Rebus community um, forum or platform, you'll come across what's called the open textbook directory. Um, this is uh, really a tool that was um, created by Rebus um, to help be more transparent about um, OER projects that are in production or in creation. So um, anyone here can, um, can create an account, create a project. Um, I have two that I've pulled up. Um, one is from, um, I believe, a group of educators working in um, the state of New York who just come out with an introduction to LGBTQ plus studies open textbook. So as you can see, this page just offers a very quick overview of the type of material being created, the team behind the material, the stage of the project, um, an outline if it's available, resources that folks might be able to use if they want to create a similar text or are curious to, to again, learn more about um, the production workflows and processes behind uh, the, this publication, and also a discussion. So this links back to that um, um, discussion forum um, that I showed you earlier, where folks are just talking about um, um, conversations specific to that particular project. Um, this particular site and this particular page, a lot of the examples you've seen so far are in English, but the conversations and interactions don't need to be limited to English. Um, we have a lot of Spanish language projects um, that are on here as well, a few French and German language projects as well. I don't speak either of those languages particularly well, so I'm going to save myself the embarrassment of going, going through those, but um, we really envision both the forum space as well as this directory and sort of um, project directory as a space to be uh, open about the work that often happens behind closed doors, behind the curtain, um, and to really let folks come together and collaborate on projects that they might be working on um, at different parts of the world, different parts of the globe, and instead join forces, come together, share knowledge, expertise, and tools. Um, what is the backend technology for the ebooks? Uh, for the ebooks, Rebecca asks. So 
um, this particular page is, is custom created by, um, by us at Rebus. This particular forum site is powered by a tool called Discourse, and I can drop a link into that into the chat soon after. Um, Rebus also tends to use um, tools like Pressbooks to publish our own um, OER and openly licensed materials. Uh, much like uh, Navya and Lauren were talking about, you know, the importance of offline access, we really like Pressbooks as an open source tool that lets us not only publish our um, open resources on the web, but also allows folks to download the content in multiple formats, especially helpful for um, those who, again, live in areas where internet connectivity is, uh, is not always reliable or in internet in, in general is unstable. So I won't be diving into this tool into too much detail. I think um, Remy or, or Nate will, will tell you about the Pressbooks workshop that might be happening at another part of my fest. I might stop sharing my screen right now and just um, take a moment to pause and note that the Rebus's approach to publishing in general, but also our tools are centered on the tenets of inclusive design and equity. And these are things that we try to bring in to every stage of our, our process, uh, really because we believe that it's easier to incorporate these principles from, from day one, rather than thinking about it uh, as a makeshift solution at the end of a particular tool selection or decision-making process. Um, so in that regard, the people, the processes, and the tools are all integral to our approach. Um, I like to use um, the words inclusive design um, when I'm talking about our approach. Um, this is a term I've uh, borrowed from um, the uh, Inclusive Design Research Center here uh, at OCAD University in, in Toronto. And this simply refers to flexible solutions, flexible solutions that we find to create a learning environment where learners can come create their own paths and meet their specific needs. So when we're thinking about our tools and when we're working with educators who are publishing open textbooks or open educational resources, we're asking them to think beyond just um, uh, inclusivity in terms of technical or web accessibility. I appreciate that Tell brought up privacy and surveillance as a key consideration to keep in mind. Um, for us, we think not only about the technical accessibility of tools, do they meet um, the web content accessibility guideline uh, standards, but in terms of the content itself, um, the content that is being published and created, regardless of whether it's published on Colibri, on Pressbooks, on LibreText, on Wikiversity or somewhere else, um, is that content created with the audience in mind? Is it well structured so that the learning objectives can be met? Um, is it written in an understandable tone or vocabulary? Are you using images um, and not only making sure that they are accessible in terms of captions and alt text, but are you only using them when necessary? Um, and the last dimension that we tend to think about when we're thinking about tools is the human dimension. Um, there was an excellent publication recently called Learning to be Human Together, where they talk about um, how human accessibility in particular um, starts with an awareness of what it means to be human together. So we're thinking about, you know, where there are people there and where there are tools, there's also power dynamics and systemic and historical cycles of exclusion, privilege and inequitable access. So part of decision making, whether it's deciding between a Google Drive versus uh, uh, an open source, um, 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 organization tool or open office and say Microsoft Word, we also need to explore our own situatedness and positionality and our settled states to understand, you know, are there things that we need to learn or unlearn or consider if we haven't yet considered to move forward with um, an accessible and equitable teaching and learning environment. Um, we try to emphasize that just creating the OER uh, and selecting a tool um, to publish and share that OER um, is not the end, but it's also about uh, being mindful and intentional about the choices behind it and bringing that practice into your pedagogy into the classroom. Um, so I appreciate it, Tell, that you talked about how you're using Mastodon instead of, say, Twitter um, in those types of open pedagogy assignments in the classroom. And we really hope that on um, at Rebus, by asking educators to 
think of these questions up front when they're creating an assignment or a textbook or any kind of publication that they're going to carry this forward when they're actually using that that particular resource into the classroom um, with students. Um, and I will note, you know, one of those tensions for us has always been balancing the open source with what folks can and can't use at institutions. So you might have seen me using Google Drive or Google Slides uh, rather than perhaps uh, uh, more secure tools. So that's that's a, a tension that I haven't quite answered in my work at Jebus. But I will note that for me, openness also means uh, flexibility in changing these tools down the road. So I think for us, an inflexible approach to OER means just committing to one tool and, and sticking with that for forever and always. Uh, at Rebus, we're sort of committed to change uh, and committed to change based on either what our learners and partners and educators or the community needs. Um, and we're open to making whether it's minor changes in our practice and approach or really larger ones in terms of how we're connecting folks um, and encouraging that they come together and share their expertise. And I think that might be a, a good place to pause for questions. Commitment to change. I love that, Apurva. And, you know, I really appreciate how all the work that Rebus does is recognizes that, you know, you can't just build tools and, and call the problem solved. There's so much more that goes into, you know, effective open practices than, than just having a tool at your disposal, right? appreciate your attention to that at Rebus. Um, I'm wondering, um, go two ahead. questions in the chat, um, um, perhaps both around what is a textbook. And I'll say we use a very loose and broad definition of both the term textbook and book. Perhaps learning material or learning resource would be more accurate. Uh, but this could really range from a simple um, activity uh, and sort of quiz set to a full-fledged um, collection of, of units and chapters that you might formally call a book. So we're very agnostic in terms of, of what you know, a textbook is. Um, we really sort of believe in letting educators come in and make those uh, um, decisions for their students and for their classrooms. Um, and we know that you can teach with anything from a, a 500 page book to a, a five second TikTok. So it, it could be the full scale of, of, of content. But uh, yeah, and I'm, I was just thinking going back way back to a question that Virginia posed early on in the chat around, um, you know, I think all, all y'all of the guests assembled here have been like deeply involved in forming communities, especially communities around folks who are not focused on like a North American or Anglo, um, uh, kind of focused to use the word twice. <laughs> but um, I'm wondering if you have thoughts and maybe start with you Apurva, around how to help build community, especially communities that ex go beyond or don't even include necessarily that kind of North American and Anglo focus. Um, I, I have thought about this quite often. And um, I think where we've landed uh, on the Rebus front is really to be, um, as communicative and open as possible about the work we're doing and the areas of help and support that we need. Um, for instance, we've been working on an introduction to philosophy series, Nate, that, that you've been involved in as well for about seven years now. Um, part of that particular project involved putting out a call for authors, reviewers, and editors. And the calls included an explicit statement that said, we are seeking um, support and individuals and expertise from folks um, working on these perhaps very niche subgenres of, of the field. Um, it's also maybe a matter of um, encouraging folks to, to, to spread the word within their networks and making sure you're not gatekeeping with, with your asks and requests around, you know, you need to have this particular subset of, of knowledge or this particular professional certificate to come and be involved to really be welcoming and open um, in terms of, of how you share, where you share, and, and what you're expecting back. Um, perhaps the other guests will have suggestions around channels to share. Um, the OE Global Connect space is one that's also coming to mind that's also powered by discourse. That's a great way to um, 
move beyond maybe disciplined listservs or state or provincial or federal uh, institutions and networks as well. But Laura and Navya, tell over to you. I, I think on our side, um, in terms of building community, um, what's interesting about our model is that, um, first off, we don't know everyone who uses Calibri, but then there's also all these local communities that form around it. Um, and so often when we're um, both building community and trying to identify learning resources that might not, that might be more relevant to the community and or not Anglo focused, often there are teachers or these implementing organizations that are really familiar. So for us, it's not about, it's definitely not about us dictating um, what's needed, but rather um, identifying what communities already exist um, within other networks and kind of bringing them into more of the kind of OER dialogue space, because I think we often see one of the biggest challenges that we face, and that I'm sure others do too, is recognizing that there's a lot of really fantastic local content creation that isn't necessarily done by publishers, but rather by teachers or, or other nonprofits, but um, without the open license, or particularly a Creative Commons license apply, the, the content can't be used to the same extent, and so community building looks slightly different. Um, for us, we've, I, I'm really glad that Aperva brought up this concept of going beyond just technical interoperability, um, because for us, similarly, we want to ensure that whenever new content is created, that it can be, um, it can reach its full potential, so to speak, to reach as many audiences as possible, depending upon, um, you know, recognizing what the content was initially intended for its use, but then thinking more broadly about how it can be adapted and reused. Um, and so I think in addition to all the criteria that Aperva laid out, we're also wanting to add something to the mix, a term that we're calling portability. And that concept is thinking about how accessible, adaptable, and contextualizable resources are. So positionality obviously is a core component of that, but also thinking about like how can content quote travel, particularly um, in our work, recognizing that a lot of content is in some way tied to the internet and it really limits its ability for um, the, to be adaptable or contextualizable. And then in terms of um, bringing it back to this initial question that Nate posed around building community, um, it really then limits the potential use of this content and, and therefore um, you know, limits the potential to, to understand how the materials can be used. Um, this is a, a, a concept that we presented at the Creative Commons Summit last year, and we, we put together a tool, an assessment tool specific on this concept of portability, recognizing that it can complement other types of tools, but just wanting to make sure that this concept isn't lost in the mix when thinking about developing open content. Sorry, I went slightly off track there. <laughs> There is a link, um, I will pull that up for you, but it's still in development. So at this point, we're really asking for feedback um, as we develop it. Well, as, as somebody pointed out, you know, being too linear with our conversation is sort of an Anglo trait we might want to leave behind anyway. So tell, um, what, what, what about you and building community? You've been, been doing this for a while. Do you have perspectives on building communities outside of, uh, Anglo North American culture, I think so. Yeah, uh, I do, and it's a, a simple one: give us money. Um, uh, I, I joke about this because I started out talking to funders about this as, as a way to say, you know, um, it's it's really it's really nice that we want to raise awareness, but uh, without funds, it gets very difficult to do. So, I think Apurva was mentioning this idea of, of you know free and open source software isn't free in the sense of development, and I think people take some time to, to realize that these initiatives are costly. A colleague of mine says, you know, we, we should get over the idea that education is costly. Education costs money. We shouldn't be trying to save money. That should never be our first imperative. We should try to be, make better use of money but, and use it in an open fashion. So I think that um, we have a lot of challenges in getting, um, sorry, now the, it's the, the car sound system came around. So let me let someone else speak for the first. <laughs> Yeah, I know there's another initiative afoot that I've been a little bit a part of called Invest in Open Infrastructure, and it's precisely focused on trying to reorganize how we think about the, um, you know, the the funding that we already have and already spend. I think to Tell's point, um, and how we might be able to better allocate that. Um, I can provide a link for that as well. I saw Aprova shaking her head vigorously there. 
<laughs> so I'll just finish that train of thoughts and I'll be so negative. But but one of the things that I, I think in, in building communities, uh, in, in, especially in, in lesser spoken languages, one of the problems we have is still have a very, um, uh, I think, rooted perspective on everybody that we have to translate content that's given to us in English, right? Or we have to produce content in two languages. And this, this kind of burden isn't really recognized. So if we want to make ourselves heard, we have to write articles in English. We have to publish our content in three languages. Our sites have to be in three or four languages. We have to update them. We have no money to do it. And funders are very, very interested in helping, you know, poor countries. But when you when you ask for money for awareness or translation, this is really not seen as a very important issue. And I, I speak from experience and from other colleagues as well. I think this, this, this uh, you know, the OER recommendation from UNESCO really points out this one of the big, one of the biggest topics of multilingual, translatable, adaptable, inclusive, rescuing lesser spoken languages. And I think we still don't do a very good job in creating this kind of community. Um, one of the really interesting ways people try to do this in, in the latest uh, OE Global Conference was to have the conference in six languages, for example. That was a really, really interesting exercise. Uh, and I think that we, we we might experiment more with that, knowing that it's not an easy thing to do, but not just pay lip service and really try to make sure that whenever we do things like this, you'll say, well, here's here's our resource now translated. Uh, that's that's really not very inclusive at all. Yeah, so true. Uh, the it seems like there's always always seems to be funding for new shiny tools and very rarely funding for the kind of or I'll call them wraparounds, <laughs> you know, needs that might accompany that in terms of community building translation, all the things that Tal just talked about, all the things that that approve is engaged in. There's a hand up made from um, I don't know if it's Alia or Alia, but please jump in. Yes. yes, thank you so much, Aperva. Thank you all for a fruitful discussion so far. I'm enjoying this. And I actually praise the fact that Aperva mentioned the importance of humanizing learning. I feel like humanization is the foundation of education, open learning, uh, community building, whatever it may be. And you actually reminded me of a quote, which I really actually cherish. And uh, I'd be happy to share with you all. Uh, it's more directly related between a teacher and a student relationship, but it's pretty touching and emotional if you think about it. It says, I've come to a frightening conclusion that I am the decisive element in the classroom. It's my daily mood that makes the weather. As a teacher, I possess a tremendous power to make a child's life miserable or joyous. I can be a tool of torture or an instrument of inspiration. I can humiliate or humor, hurt or heal. In all situations, it is my response that decides whether a crisis will be escalated or de-escalated and a child humanized or dehumanized. Wow. Oh, it touches really my powerful. heart each time I read it. So I thought of sharing it with you all uh, with regards to humanization, humanizing learning, everything like that. Thank you once again for being here around and I, I look forward to our future sessions as well. Greetings from Egypt. <laughs> Thank you, Egypt. <laughs> Thank you for bringing that perspective. Um, yeah, I, I have long, um, there are so many, having worked in tools almost my whole life, I, uh, I have more and more turned to the fact that we all know that one of the things that can affect human teaching and learning most powerfully is human interaction. And um, I imagine Ramey might even have something to say about that. And so I actually uh, sort of um, am sad about how much time I've devoted to, to tools when, when uh, humanity is, is so important. Ramey? I would just thank you. I just want to, again, thank you know, all of our guests today. And, and Alia, the quote that you just read um, resonates very strongly with my experience listening to all of them and also the, the wisdom that you've all shared with us. Um, you know, this may sound selfish, but I would love to hear from our guests a little bit about how you all balance, um, you know, really deep commitments to the technical aspects of your work in terms of the use of tools, your design processes, um, and how you're interpreting open in that respect with what also appears to be unflappable ethical commitments to communities and partnerships, if not particular political stances. And I think that that can be a very tricky balance actually to make that when trying to do both 
extremely innovative technical work and also kind of clear-headed ethical work that it sometimes is not easy to do both at the same time. And many of the stories and examples that you've shared with us, I think, speak to that. And is again, in, at least in my experience, quite rare. Um, and, and so maybe there's a bit of some commentary in there and maybe a bit of a question about how, how do you all do that um, day to day in your work, given again, the various roles and responsibilities that, that, that you all have? That's a heavy question. Oh, go ahead, Tell. No, no, I, I was waiting for somebody else. Go, you go, and then I'll go. Well, well my answer is perhaps, uh, with the battle, I think the ethical commitment always wins for us. Um, like that is sort of the non-negotiable. We we cannot compromise on on the people and and the mission and the values. Uh, and it means we're looking around for other technical solutions that will work to to meet those um, ethics and values. I think. The, the bottom line is is really that um, I, I wanted to mention in the chat, you know, full disclosure for our software is we're a team of three people on Rebus community right now. We actually don't have a, a software developer or, or uh, anyone working on the technical side at this point due to funding constraints and the rest, but we're still trying to put out as much um, as we can in terms of resources and guides, which is sort of where we're seeing you know, we're hearing from at least the communities that we're working with um, that they need support around. Um, it's not an easy balance at all. And there's always that sense of we could be doing more and that that feeling of potential unfulfilled. But I think we also have to take the step back and look at in staying true to those principles that, that we have, um, what impact are we having with folks? Um, and really the focus is more on, on growing impact than just scaling for the sake of. So that's what at least guides guides me in my thinking, but tell back to you and maybe Navi and Lauren. Yeah, I think we also resonate with that. There's always this tension of, um, you know, the day-to-day -day and then also making sure that we're centering um, our vision, which is to, um, enable learners to transform themselves and the community and really have a focus on student-centered learning. And I think um, another big conversation that we've been having internally on the team has also been how we continue to not to ha give the power and voice to the communities and everything that we do as it comes to getting feedback on our features, as it relates to making decisions on our product roadmap, as it um, relates to whenever we have a training workshop, how do we create a space which is conducive to making sure that we're centering the experiences and the voices of the community that we're, um, that we're working with. And I think Lauren can drop the link, but one, another key, aspect that we've been focusing on at learning equality is having a set of design principles focused on human-centered design and um, keeping our vision of student-centered learning um, in that as well and Lauren can probably expand more on our process and where and how we reach this but we hope again like it's it's as it, we don't want it to be aspirational we want it to be imbibed in our day-to-day -day activities um, across our you know our, our software development um, team but also our implementations team and the way that we make decisions and our strategy but um, Lauren do you want to expand more on that yeah and this isn't directly related I think to to the question of building on what Aprova was saying and like also like I lead our partnership works and, and I think it also speaks to how you also identify collaborators um, and recognizing not just our own positionality as an organization but recognizing also that we don't have not only the same lived experience but even just a baseline understanding of contextual realities of our partners and so how do we kind of find that balance and also identifying just the kind of like to Navi's point not just being aspirational but just being realistic too about um, what can be the most impactful because at the end of the day too for us we're developing a set of public goods um, so that balance between like you know still having a net positive um, but also recognizing everything that we just talked about, which I think we probably value more, is, is part of the tension. One of the things that I 
well, I'm, I'm, you know, my, my role as a teacher educator here at the university, and one of the things that I, I, I find still kind of amazing with students is that they, future educators, they still think of, of tools as, as separate from, from didactics or pedagogical practice, right? As, as if you could really dissociate your, your, the processes of education from the tools you select. It's, it's kind of a, a thing that you have to, you have to bring back. And the tools are not a separate decision. They're, they're an integral part. So just like we're doing here today, kind of open educational practice. I mean, there's no such thing as a, an open educational practice without a tool. So these choices become very hard and become very difficult. And they're really important. You know, we can't just do whatever we want and then eventually think about what media choice we're going to make, like we did in the 70s. Um, but I also think that there's, there's another point, which often comes up, and it's come up in our discussion here, too, is that this idea of open source as a savior, right? So uh, we have large communities and groups here where people go and say, well, you shouldn't be using WhatsApp. You should be using XMPP or a matrix.org protocol or some other combination of letters that are really important to you. And, and I think that's, that's uh, counterproductive, but also um, it, it really just doesn't help the movement. When you tell somebody, if you change from using WhatsApp to something else, you're, you're actually making a net improvement on, on the world and openness. You really aren't. I mean, you actually just disempowering that person to communicate with other people. Um, so one of the things that I think is, is really important, the, the thing that we're discussing is this idea of collective action, right? If we can't get people to mobilize collectively in their organizations, their groups to do anything, just uh, you know, shaming somebody into, not, into using open source software or pointing out that there's an alternative really won't help anybody do anything. And I think that it's the same thing with the tools that we use to create OER and the, the open practices that we have. It's really nice to show them and people that there are places like, you know, we were just showing a lot of really cool platforms where you can do excellent stuff that you never thought you could do and it they're seamlessly will integrate into your practice and that's great but to shame somebody into saying you know you're you're an idiot because you're using some sort of tool that's not open really doesn't help us at all well and perhaps to laura's point in the chat and to some of the complexities that maybe we all you know engage with in our own day-to-day -day work um, maybe there's aspects of this around creating pockets of resistance or pockets of kind of counter narrative, as some would say. I don't need to get too jargony here, but it's to say that, you know, right, whether we're using Twitter for our social networking purposes or Zoom right now to connect in this space or, you know, Nate's really, you know, lovely Google Doc that we all put together for the slides of this presentation, which will be shared with you. You know, we, we recognize the complexities of using platforms to also pursue particular ends. And so I think that's what motivated in some part the question I asked earlier, because we are engaging with the whole repertoire of technologies and servers and all kinds of infrastructural supports in, you know, light of the more visionary work that we hope to do in the world. So thank you for, yeah, please, please sorry. I would just think part of the visionary work is not just sort of beating at the problem from the outside, but it's also understanding the systems and structures that we currently and tools that we currently operate in and try to, uh, you know, incentivize change from within as well as from, from the outside, right? I think that approach to here use the alternative is hard to do because that involves a big behavior shift if we, if we really want all of the billions of people in this world to make that shift with us. So there needs to be a bit of both um, always. It's not just build a new open and equitable system and, and everybody will come. That would be wonderful. But th that's also not the, the reality of, of the world we live in and inhabit. Um, I feel like WhatsApp is an, is an especially potent example to mention because outside of the United States, I find so where I live, so many people actually make really big use of WhatsApp in their, their community communications. I don't participate because I've actually given up on using Facebook on tool, tools, but it actually what it does is it cuts me off from that community. And so I can't participate. And so I've really kind of shot myself in the foot. One of the things that I've really liked about having these discussions be scheduled for 90 minutes is that it often turns out that we find out that we did need more than an hour, but we didn't necessarily need 90 minutes either. And we could actually end early, but with some comfort instead of some panic. 
And so I would say that if we feel like this discussion has reached a natural resting place, we could just decide to end here, but I'd also don't, we have more time allotted if folks have, have can stay. So if somebody does have another topic that they wanna bring up or make sure we, we, we get across, I'm certainly happy to entertain it as I'm sure everyone else is. So I'll be quiet for a minute and see what, what people think and say. Virginia, please Virginia, come. yeah, go ahead. <laughs> You're way ahead of me, probably. <laughs> I'm just interested in knowing, um, especially these foundations um, in working in these different communities, what are the ways in which you get around the institutional barriers, either governmental or um, university or school, um, education departments in using an open resource platform, for example, or tool? Um, if I may, I think the question should be not just how do you get around these systems, but how do you also work within them at the same time? Um, because my biggest fear sometimes too is that in go if you kind of go around these systems, how are we further, uh, for lack of a better phrase, shooting ourselves in the foot for adoption of these tools in the future? That's like, it's one of my biggest fears. So um, like for us with Calibri specifically, um, one of the things that's unique about it is that it's used both in formal and non-formal learning spaces. So oftentimes we've seen where there's been strong adoption in you know, after school programs or in library centers, and they develop content that's either um, locally created or and or a combination of materials organized from our library, which often consists of local content. And then through that kind of usage, um, they're able to also receive more local buy-in to then have it be used more in formal schools and then talk to curricular bodies about looking at that content and then think about what training is needed um, and, and so on and so forth. And so um, I think we need to think about both of those things. So like one response to your question, I think is about, you know, what are other spaces in which these tools can be used that um, often are within those structures, but not necessarily part of the formal government systems. Um, but also thinking about like, what are the quote proper channels? Because that's the only way that you can really have broad adoption um, and particularly to get buy-in by teachers who already are under-resourced, have limited time and are continually being met with like changing standards and different tools that they're being told to use. Um, so, so that's been some of our experience and I'm sure Navia can elaborate further if um, there's anything else to add. Virginia, if you wanted to even come back and restate restate your question to remind us all what your initial focus was that would be that could be well welcome. I guess it's um I I know having done virtual um exchanges with other countries that a lot of times when we're trying to choose a tool in which both sides will be will be able to um and it's not just barriers that are the official barriers, it's also even technological barriers um, and the integration of, um, you know, what's, what's used by students, for example. Um, the, the one advantage I, I had in working with Brazil, for example, is the fact that um, a lot of my students were also in rural areas. And so a lot of them depended on cell phones so any technology that we chose, we made sure that it was um, it would be um, low um, low in graphics, low bandwidth, um, and and we tended to, we did want to do some synchronous, but we realized also that there were some difficulties with doing synchronous instead of asynchronous if you have times of day where you can't get on the internet. So um, I, I'm, I liked the way that um, in all of these, they discussed, for example, um, alternative ways that they were able to communicate with the communities that they were in and get people on board with uh, using a, a different technology than the one that 
you know, well, we bought Google or we bought this LMS, therefore we must use it. Um, and that's always a big problem, especially if you're in a large university system like I was. Yeah, Tali, you have your hand up, I see. Yeah, I, th I think we, I'm not sure I, I'm interpreting correctly, but I, I, I wanted to point out something which, which uh, you said that I think is interesting is, is how we sometimes think about the, the tools that we're offering uh, and we don't pay attention to the pressures that people face when they're using other types of tools. So one of the things that we find through this observatory that we have here on surveillance is, is this idea that it's normally very hard to, to tell people to use alternative tools when institutionally they're pressured into using specific systems, right? So the classic example here for Brazil is if you have Google Workspace or, or Microsoft Teams as, as part of your platforms, your, your life pretty much revolves around these systems and, and, and being uh, uh, and challenging this, these, these platforms and the use of the platforms, even in, in pedagogical practice, becomes very difficult to do. You almost add another burden rather than substituting one thing for another. So we have to be very cautious, particularly in places that have adopted these kinds of tools or whatever other LMS they're using, um, that, that this doesn't become another burden. I agree. I, I know that's what you said, but I agree with you. And if I can just jump in there with a quick note here, just to say that that also concerns people's institutional roles as well. You know, in my institution, as a tenured professor, I have the incredible flexibility to just throw the LMS away and take pedagogical risks with certain tools and practices that my untenured, non-tenured track and contingent faculty members, because of their institutional, you know, positions of power, do not have the ability to make. And so I can, in my practice, advocate for a whole host of open processes that are simply much more untenable for other colleagues of, of mine. And so I think it's important to, as, as has been said throughout our conversation, the contextual situated realities of people's you know, professional responsibilities have to be taken into consideration. We, we need not you know, jeopardize someone's employment just because we think that they should use open tools, right? That's, that's important to consider as well. Yeah, one, one uh, uh, way that I've thought about this in the past too is that um, it is kind of putting on the digital, digital literacies hat for a second because, you know, there's in the United States at least, there are so many classes that focus on, you know, helping people to use very specific pieces of software like Microsoft Excel. There will be a whole class in Microsoft Excel, but it doesn't really focus on teaching you the underlying dynamics of spreadsheets in general, right? Regardless of which spreadsheet you might, tool you might use. And so you maybe walk away from that class knowing what buttons to push in Microsoft Excel, but not how to approach any, um, any uh, spreadsheet or database program that you might encounter in the future with some knowledge. And so I think part of what we can do maybe is recast the tools that we use for pedagogy as uh, as a as a digital literacies component of the pedagogy itself. So, but that means there's then time devoted to, you know, the tools discussion in the context of something else. You might be teaching and learning around biology, for example, but then you would need to have a conversation around tools as well, which adds to the time and the impact. And, you know, not everybody has the privilege to put that into place. Perhaps the, what we need to be doing is re casting the net even further back and saying, well, what is the purpose of, of the university and education system and, and who are we trying to help? Therefore, what tools should we be using or should we be enabling or allowing folks to use? And you know, that's not a 15 of us on this Zoom call cannot solve that right now, but I think it does have to trickle back to that. And Virginia, I don't know if you're in a position in your conversations with folks to maybe begin that discussion around tools with that question of, you know, what is the purpose? Who are we designing for? And how can we design our project or co-design our project with equity in mind um, and sort of go through that route? Um, it's, it's, I know it's a, it's a it's seemingly logical idea, a lot of but hard, hard to, to put into practice. Uh, but again, I mean, that's, that's the fight we keep fighting, right? And actually, um, I'm, I just retired um, this past year, but I did do teaching training and with, with school teachers from around our area that were anywhere from preschool up to adult ed. 
And um, every single subject that you can think of teaching ed, ed tech. And I would always begin the course by saying, what is something that you currently cannot do in your classroom face-to-face -face, that you would like to be able to do better? And then we would start with that idea because most of them would begin by saying, I wanna do this project. And, I, and I'd say, yeah, but you can do this already in your classroom. So what is it that technology is gonna do in order to um, allow you to do better? And one of the first things we did was to look at resources that they could and couldn't use and requirements such as curriculum and standards that they could or couldn't use. But it still was always a problem with them and, and even myself working in the university because I wasn't tenured, um, going up against, can we try this? No, you can't. Okay, <laughs> so then how can we get in some of these open resources? How can we modify these um, structures that are so oppressive <laughs> that you're stuck using? And, and change within those. Um, and a lot of times I did go, um, you know, as I, I taught there for 20 years. So by about the year 15, I was like, okay, we're just going out of the LMS. Um, but yes. it, it, it's very difficult to fight that mentality. As, as the point that, that Bridget May makes in the chat though, I think is, is potent here, right? Is that one, one can, you know, if you move away from open source tools and move to, you know, open learning and open educational practices in general, they could happen in a variety of different contexts, right? And so tools, making sure that the tools are open or closed isn't only the only necessary step like Kel was getting to as well. Well, you know what, we are getting pretty close to, to the end of our 90 minutes here. And I did, I have promised um, the organizers of my fest that I would make sure to share with you all that they have a very short, what they call two minute paper, that they would love it if people spent two minutes um, actually um, reflecting a little bit on their experience in the session. And so uh, you don't have to do it right now, but um, everyone at my, you know, this is my fest first, um, first, you know, <laughs> happening ever. And part of the question here is, should we do more of this in the future? Um, and make this into a non-commercial, non-proprietary, sustainable professional development experience. And so we'd love to hear your reflections um, based on that link I just shared in chat. Um, and you can do that for any session as many times as you want. Each session that you attend should have a listing there that you can, you can click on to evaluate that session or just do it once and comment on the experience overall. So um, how about I uh, give each one of our invited guests a chance to say goodbye um, and if you have any last thoughts, and we'll go, we'll go back to the top and, and start with Tell. Give you a chance to say goodbye and anything you want to leave us with. Yeah, thank you. Always great to talk about these issues. and We don't talk about them enough. So thank you for the invitation. Nice to meet some of you and see some of you and names that I know and people that I haven't met. Hope to see you soon in other places as well. Thank you so much, Tell. And uh, Lauren uh, and Navia. Uh, similarly, thank you. And I think um, the one takeaway from our end and, and Navia can complement with hers is that as you're thinking about the use of open tools and, and resources and often things that are digital, just to also think about those who might not be able to access them in the first place for whatever reason and make sure that they're included in the program design. Thank you. I echo that, second that. Uh, thank you, it's been great. And I hope that we can continue having more of these conversations and also think about how we include uh, those who are not here with us. Great, Approva and then Ramey to close us out. Great, well, thank you, Nate and Dami for, for getting us together in the first place and tell Navia Lauren for, for uh, letting me learn from you. And I also will say everybody else who maybe had dropped off earlier, this conversation wouldn't have been as informative and uh, uh, exciting without all of you. I just appreciate you listening to me speak for a, for a few minutes. Um, please do connect with community. I think that's sort of my big uh, takeaway from all of this is the, the more of us that are 
talking and talking openly and transparently, the, the farther we can go. Um, my contact details are on those slides. So whenever they get shared um, afterwards, um, you can definitely get in touch. Um, and Remy, over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, perfect. Your facilitation has been so helpful. As I just made, I just got to sit back. So most, most appreciated. Uh, again, thanks everyone who joined us today. I think as, as, as people know, one of the key um, practices perhaps uh, with MyFest is emergence and really trying to be open to the ways in which conversations grow and change even over the course of 90 minutes. And so if you've been with us the whole time, thank you for being here. Um, we hope that you jump into future MyFest sessions, whether it's part of the open learning journey or any other of the activities over months to come um, this summer. And so thank you for being here today. Uh, thank you again, Nate, and all of the MyFest organizers for really putting together such a wonderful session. And then again, to Purva and to Navia and to Lauren Patel, thank you so much. We really appreciate your wisdom. We really do.